Okay, thank you all for waiting. Uh, the moment has arrived. The star is in the house. And Jenny is here at Kino Kunia Bookstore. Where is she? And she, will, <laughs> she is uh, going to talk about her book tonight, Pachinko. Um, and she's also the author of Free Food for Millionaires, which has gobs and gobs of praise. And Pachinko is also a National Book Award finalist. So uh, Juno Diaz has, has uh, heaped praise on her. And it's a great read, believe me, I, I, I'm reading it myself, I'm almost finished. Uh, but uh, looking forward to what she has to say about it, she's going to read some things and then take some questions from you all. So please welcome author Min Jin Lee. Hi, my goodness, thank you so much for coming, goodness. Today is Tuesday, I think. I don't know what's on TV tonight, but it can't be very good because you're here. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for coming. I feel really delighted to be here. I mean, Kunit Kunia is one of my favorite stores in the entire world because I like the book selection here, but also because I love the pens and the paper, right? Because I'm truly an Asian nerd. So I, I love coming here. And of course, I like to get the matcha lattes. And so thank you so much for, oh, oh my goodness. It kind of did something funny all of a sudden. Can you hear me better now? Yes. Okay. Um, I said really important things earlier, but I'm not going to repeat them. No, I'm just kidding. So I thought that, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you for coming. It means a great deal to me. I've been on tour for a super long time, and I'm really surprised because I never, ever, ever thought that I would sell this book. I've been working on it since 1989, when I was 19 years old. I got the idea for it when I was in college. And then when I quit being an attorney, I started working on it in 2000 and, no, I'm sorry, 1996. And I wrote a version from 1996 to 2003. And then afterwards, when I realized that it sucked eggs, I put it aside and I started another book and that became Free for Millionaires. And then when I moved to Japan, I started to interview all these Korean Japanese people. And then I realized that the reason why my first book sucked so bad is because I didn't know what I was talking about. And the Korean Japanese people told me I didn't know what I was talking about. And it was really interesting because I knew a lot of history and anthropology and sociology and law, but I didn't really understand the people until I met them. And then I developed all these relationships and I interviewed dozens of Korean Japanese. And what I learned was that the Korean Japanese are so interesting and resilient and vibrant and funny and full of love. They really love Japan. And that was really important to me because I didn't know that you could suffer institutional discrimination and still love the nation in which you live. But of course, we are human beings and we are very complex. And their love for their nation, which was Japan, was quite true. And that meant that I had to revise the entire book and I threw the initial book away and I started again. I'm going to read to you a very difficult section. It's very, very short though, about six and a half minutes the length of two YouTube videos. I always read short because basically I want you to like me. And um, afterwards, John and I are gonna have a little conversation which will be recorded for posterity for YouTube. And it'll be interesting. Anyway, so I'm gonna read to you um, sort of like toward the end of the book. It's 1976. We're in Yokohama. We are not in Midtown Manhattan. And we are not at Kinakunia Bookstore. We are in an ward office in Yokohama, Japan. It's 1976. There are three characters I'd love for you to focus on. It's only really three major characters. It's Moses, who owns a pachinko parlor, his son Solomon, who is a teenage boy, and they're both Korean Japanese, and Etsuko, who is Japanese, and she is the girlfriend of Moses, the pachinko parlor owner. So from the top, Moses, pachinko parlor owner, Solomon, Moses' son, Etsuko, the Japanese girlfriend who's a restaurant owner. So, I'd like to do what we readers do best. Let's imagine. The Yokohama ward office was a giant gray box with an obscure sign. And the first clerk that they saw was a tall man with a narrow face and a shock of black hair buzzed off his asides. He stared at Etsuko shamelessly, his eyes darting across her breasts, her hips, and her jeweled fingers. 
she was overdressed compared to Moses and Solomon, who wore white dress shirts, dark slacks, and black dress shoes. They looked like the gentle Mormon missionaries who used to glide through her village on bicycles when she was a girl. Your name, the clerk squinted at the form that Solomon was filling out. Suramona, what kind of name is that? It's from the Bible. He was a king and the son of David, a man of great wisdom. My great uncle named me. And the boy smiled at the clerk as if he was sharing a secret. And the boy smiled. He was very polite. But because he had gone to school with Americans and other kinds of foreigners at his international schools, sometimes Solomon said things that a Japanese person would never have said. Solomon, king, great wisdom. Koreans don't have kings anymore. What did you say? Etsko asked. And quickly, Moses pulled her back. And she glanced at Moses. His temper was far worse than hers. Once, when a restaurant guest had tried to make her sit with him, Moses, who happened to be there that night, walked over, picked him up bodily, and threw him outside the restaurant, breaking the man's ribs. And she was expecting no less of a reaction now. But Moses averted his eyes from the clerk, and he stared at Solomon's right hand. And Moses smiled. Excuse me, sir. We're in a hurry to return home because it's the boy's birthday. Is there something that we can do? Thank you very much for understanding. And confused, Solomon turned to Etzko and she flashed him a warning look. And the clerk pointed to the back of the room and told Moses and Etzko to sit down. And Solomon remained standing opposite the clerk. And in the long rectangular room shaped like a train car with bank teller windows running parallel along opposite walls, half a dozen people sat on benches reading their newspapers or manga. And Etzko wondered if they're all Korean. And Moses sat down and then he got up again and he asked if she wanted a can of tea from the vending machine. And she nodded yes. She felt like slapping the clerk's face. In middle school, she had once slapped a gossipy girl and it had been very satisfying. And when Moses returned with their tea, she thanked him. You must have known. You must have warned him then. I mean, you told him that today would not be so easy. And after the words came out of her mouth, they sounded harsh and she felt sorry. No, I didn't say anything. And he opened and he closed his fist rhythmically. I came here with my mother and brother Noah for my first registration papers. And the clerk was normal, nice even. So I asked you to come. I thought maybe having a woman a Japanese woman by his side might help. He exhaled through his nostrils. It was stupid. It was stupid to wish for kindness. No, 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 no. You couldn't have warned him. I shouldn't have said it like that. 
It's hopeless. I cannot change his fate. He is Korean, and he has to get those papers. He has to follow all the steps of the law perfectly. Once, at a ward's office, a clerk told me that I was a guest in his country. You and Solomon were born here. Yes, my brother Noah was born here too. And Moses covered his face with his hands. Anyway, the clerk wasn't wrong. And this is something Solomon must understand. We can be deported. We have no motherland. Life is full of things he cannot control, so he must adapt. My boy has to survive. And Solomon returned to them. Next, he had his photograph taken, and afterward, he had to go to another room to get fingerprinted, and then they could go home. And the last clerk was a very pretty woman with a long ponytail. And she took Solomon's left index finger and gently dipped it into the pot filled with thick black ink. And Solomon depressed his finger onto a white card as if he was a child painting. And Moses looked away and he sighed audibly. And the clerk told him to pick up the registration papers in the next room. Let's go get your dog tags, Moses said. Solomon faced his father. Hmm? It is what we dogs must have. And the clerk looked furious suddenly. The fingerprints and the registration cards are vitally important for government records. There is no need to feel insulted by this. It is an immigration regulation required for foreign and Etsko stepped forward suddenly. But you don't make your children get fingerprinted on their birthday, do you? And the clerk's neck turned red. My son is dead. And Etsko bit her lip. She didn't want to feel anything for this woman, but she knew what it was like to lose your children. It was like you were cursed. And nothing, nothing would ever restore the desolation of your life. Koreans do a lot of good things for this country, Etsuko said. They do the difficult jobs the Japanese don't want to do. They pay taxes, they obey laws, they, they raise good families, they create jobs. You Koreans always tell me this. And Solomon blurted out, she's not Korean. And Etsuko touched his arm and the three of them walked out of the building. She wanted to crawl out of the gray box and see the light of outdoors again. She longed for the white mountains of Hokkaido and though she had never done so in her childhood, she wanted to walk in the cold, snowy forests, beneath the flanks of the dark, leafless trees. In life, there was so much insult and injury, and she had no choice but to collect what was hers. But now, she wished to take Solomon's shame and added to her pile. Oh, she was already so overwhelmed. Thank you. Well, so now we'll open it up to Q&A. Does anyone have any questions for me? So when I first started being a writer, or at least I thought I was a writer, I would always go to all these readings where authors that I admired were reading and I would sit all the way in the back and I would have like 4,000 questions 
and I didn't want to ask <laughs> because I didn't want anyone to look at me. <laughs> so if anybody feels shy, I just want you to know that I am part of your tribe. <laughs> yes? Occasion, you know, some of the history. For Koreans today, do they still have that same sense? Those that live in Japan, do they still treat them differently? I think that. I mean, Japanese, Korean, or Korean, Japanese, yeah. Yeah, so I think that things have changed in some way, like the institutional laws, some of them have changed. However, I think the social discrimination that the Koreans face today is actually quite persistent. And depending upon which group you belong to, because there are three different kinds of Koreans in Japan. You could be North Korean Japanese, which means that you could be Korean Japanese for three or four generations, and you identify with the Chongyun community, which is the North Korean community. So you might have actually gone to North Korean schools in Japan. And you can start even in almost like preschool kindergarten and go all the way up to university level if you want to. You don't have a passport because North Korea and Japan do not have a diplomatic relationship and it limits your travel abilities. Or you could be South Korean Japanese, which means that you have a South Korean passport despite the fact that you have lived in Japan for, let's say, four generations. And then that gives you the ability to move outside the country because South Korea and Japan have a diplomatic relationship. And usually if you have a South Korean passport and you're Korean Japanese, you tend to not go to the South Korean schools. There are very uh, few of those. And you go to usually Japanese schools or international schools. Or you could be a Korean Japanese who have, who's, uh, has naturalized citizenship and becomes Japanese. Kind of like the way I'm a naturalized American citizen. Having said that, even though you may have the legal status of a Japanese citizen, there isn't a single person in Japan who would ever think that you're Japanese. So I don't think anybody here would say I'm not an American if I showed you my passport, my social security card and said I'm legally an American. No one would say, no, you're not. They would actually say they're all different kinds of Americans. In Japan, and I would even argue in South Korea and in many other countries, you are not necessarily that person just because you have the legal status. So you're not Japanese just because you have um, legalized status. And in that sense, there's persistent social discrimination that occurs because people can't get married or date or sometimes um, whenever something strange happens and you happen to be Korean Japanese ethnically and let's say you make a mistake, very often that stereotype that's in the social norm gets applied to you. And I saw that co consistently, you know, 2018 is still the same. Any questions? Don't be shy. I think if I had known everything, it would have been done much faster. <laughs> so I, it took, this book took me such a long time. So I got this idea in college and then I started again in 19. 96 and worked on it until 2003 and then started again a brand, brand new version in 2007 and then I sold it in 2016. So every single iteration changed so dramatically like Sanja didn't come as a character until I was in Japan. This book was originally supposed to be about Solomon so if anybody knows this book Solomon's like this much part of the book now and what happened was when I went to Japan I interviewed all these different Solomon types of people like Korean Japanese guys who worked at General Electric or you know in the credit division or Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley. So I meet all these people who had gone to like Colombia who were ethnically Koreans, you know, they had pachinko families. And then I thought, they're really nice, but they're kind of boring. Like I can't write a novel about them. So that was really kind of helpful to go, okay, I'm gonna have to rethink this. And invariably when I did all my interviews, they would often talk about the first generation of Korean Japanese mothers and fathers who had done these incredibly crazy things to survive. Like, you know, pick garbage, raise pigs in their house, have moonshine, and, you know, like make candy out of, you know, this much sugar and this much water and invent new categories of confection. And I was like, oh, okay, I better like really rethink this book. So, and that's the reason why I had to scrap the first one and write another one. Oh, thank you very much.
and it's just a lot of good work for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, there's a young lady with a... Um, okay. um, first of all, thank you so much for this book. It was enlightening and I'm super American. Well, hey, what's your name? Colleen. Colleen, sister. Okay. <laughs> Well, there's no reason why you would know it because I didn't know it. It's not taught anywhere. Yeah. It's not taught anywhere. People are always saying, I don't know. And I'm going, well, how would you know? You'd have to really look for it. Yeah, and I think that's why this book is um, so important in that way. It kind of opened up this, this whole world. Oh, thank you. Um, and it's funny because, you know, I've traveled to Japan. I have friends in Japan. Uh, you would think that this would come up somehow or something, but it never happened. Well, I think it makes everybody really uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. My husband is half Japanese, my son is a quarter Japanese, and I have family in Japan who are Japanese. And I think that it makes the topic makes everybody really nervous and uncomfortable. And I think that things will never change socially unless we start talking about how uncomfortable we are. But my question to you is, um, I found that that was so heartbreaking. I imagine that as a writer, especially since we've carried this book with you over so many years, you know, felt you're super attached to your characters. Did you have like an emotional? Like, what was kind of the process in going through this story and then deciding Colleen has raised the point, and I don't want to repeat her statement because it might be a spoiler for those of you who might not have read the book. No, no, it's okay. But what I will say is that Colleen's point is really valid, is that some, some of the characters die in this book. And did I have an emotional attachment to their deaths? And also, how was it when I was writing the book? And I think that's a really valid point. One of the things that I do talk about a little bit at the end of the paperback, if you look at the Q&A, is I read a wonderful essay by Elaine Showalter when she's a literary scholar and she was writing about Lily Bart in the book House of Mirth. I don't know if you guys have read The House of Mirth and I'm just going to spoil House of Mirth for you right now because that's not the book we're talking about today. <laughs> to pretend this is a literature class. So anyway, so what, um, Lily, what Joe Walter says about Lily Bart's death is that what, it, it showed the progression of Edith Wharton's development as an artist. And the reason why the lady or the lady pretender Lily has to die and the reason why the working class girl lives is because Wharton was trying to say that this is phase of her life had ended of pretending to be a lady and that she was going to become a working person. One of the things that I'm going to suggest is that when one of my characters who I absolutely love dies, I was trying to say that when you are trying to pretend to be something that you're not, you are living a kind of death anyway. So a literal death becomes inevitable. And I did think that that character who dies is very cruel to his family because he had a kind of binary thinking of purity, which was no different than the people who discriminated against him. And consequently, when he does die, it makes sense to me that he would have planned for that eventuality of, because he could not face a world in which he himself was going to contaminate someone else. So for him, it was a ritual purity to die, which is, of course, culturally specific. There was a gentleman right, yes, with a beard. Yeah. Um, my question is a little bit similar. Um, I have read in your acknowledgement that you were inspired by a story of a Korean boy jumping off the roof, um, hopefully to his death, and without giving away too much, that kind of is recurring within the book, this topic of suicide. Um, and unfortunately, as suicide culture in Japan has come to the spotlight with Logan Paul's stupid video in the suicide forest, so as an American that doesn't know so much about suicide, why is that something that's so prevalent um, in, in, in the book and it seems to be in Japan, Korean culture? Not so prevalent, but it just seems like... No, it's a big problem. It's absolutely a big problem. So South Korea is an OECD country for over two decades. So it became so an OECD country's organization for economic cooperation and development. It's a high status organization which indicates that you're an advanced economy. And in South Korea, to have gone into the OECD over two decades ago was an incredible feat. However, of that 
Of all those countries, South Korea has been the number one country for suicide rate for the past 13 years in a row. It is a really serious problem for people in my community here as well as in South Korea. And, it's, and actually, it's beaten Japan in this data point about 15 years ago. It's nothing, it's no statistic that you want to beat anyone in. However, I do think that in a Judeo-Christian context, suicide is a very different thing than in other countries. And in shame-based cultures like Japan and in South Korea, it's really, it, you almost see it, and I'm not saying that this is correct, it is a certain cultural value, that the idea that you could bring shame to your clan, to your family, to your name, is so reprehensible that sometimes they actually see this as an option. I personally, as a person of the West, do not think it's an option. I think, I think of suicide and I think of it in a very different Western psychological point of view. However, I think that to apply my standard on another culture is not always helpful in terms of understanding a person's cultural and psychological formation. So I'm respectful of those things, but I wanted to represent what is going on, which I find really troubling. Oh, thank you. And I was really curious, uh, because you've done so much background research and interviews with obviously people living in Japan, I was just wondering how you as a novelist sort of tackle authenticity to writing authentic characters um, in kind of a, a topic or you know, social historical context that you're not What's your name? What's it? Nicole. So Nicole's question is about authenticity, is how do I approach authenticity being a per person who's not a member of this group? And that's a really great question and it's really important to me because I think this idea of cultural appropriation is very troubling for everybody. But I think that there isn't an artist that in past or present who believes that you should only write about your personal experiences. So even if I wrote about a Korean American male at her point of view, which, which is a point of view that I have enormous sympathy for, however, I'm not a Korean American male. Does that mean that I can only write about me? Therefore, I think what's really important is to approach whenever you write about somebody else that's not you, is with, with, is with great humility. And I think because I was so over, over humbled by this topic because I was terrified of doing things wrong that it took me three decades. And I did do every single piece of research I could humanly do, including translations whenever I didn't know things. And I will say that to my um, like great pleasure, I mean incredible pleasure, the day after tomorrow at Johns Hopkins there's going to be an academic symposium where scholars around the country are coming to talk about this book because anthropologists, historians, and political scientists, and literature um, folks who are academics have found that this book is um, merit attention in a scholarly way because I did approach it with that level of research. And I wanted so much to get it right because I couldn't imagine disappointing this community again. But you're right, it's not where I'm from. People often ask, is this based on your family? And it's like, no, I'm Korean American and my parents are you know, from different parts of the Korean Peninsula, but they did not go to Japan, except for my grandfather. My grandfather did go to Japan to study briefly, but he would not be considered Korean Japanese. Thank you. Yes. Hi, thank you again for this amazing book. Um, thank you. I was really curious about sort of its reception in Korea and Japan. Has it been translated? Have you done book tours there? What has been the audience reaction to the book that you've noticed? Oh, what's her name? Michelle. So Michelle's question is, um, has it been translated in South Korea and in Japan? And also its reception and what's, and have I toured there? So it has been translated in South Korea. I think it's come out about two weeks ago, and the publisher is Munhak Sasan, and you could get it. It's sold in two different volumes, and it's I think it's doing well. I, I don't know. I've gotten, <laughs> I've gotten lovely reviews that I've been told about. My mother's delighted. She read it. <laughs> And she is the toughest customer. <laughs> Let me tell ya. <laughs> so, and then as for Japan, um, I sold it two weeks ago. So 23 countries have now uh, purchased it. It will be la translated into 23 languages. And I can't disclose the name of the Japanese publisher yet because we have interest from two different publishers, but they're both amazing. 
publishers. So I'm so relieved because it was difficult to answer because every reading someone says, has it been translated in Japan? And I was like, no, it hasn't. And everybody's like, well, of course not. And, and so, and I would always defend Japan, like, I think there must be a reason. You know, they have their own Korean Japanese writers. Maybe they don't want me to say anything. But this publisher has taken it on, and I, I'm pretty sure I'm going to go with this one publisher who's incredible. So I'm delighted. And in terms of the um, have I toured, I have. I did speak at the Foreign Correspondence Club of Japan, which is the leading media organization for all Western press in Tokyo, and I had a conversation formally with um, Matoko Rich, who is the bureau chief of the New York Times, and you know, pretty much every press person was there, and it was so lovingly received and so kindly received, and I feel like the press has made a huge concerted effort to make sure that this book gets published, because I think people could sense how much I do care about the Japanese in this book too, as well as uh, Korea. And I think things would never really improve until we start talking about this very traumatic history. So thank you. Yes. Hi, uh, congratulations. Oh, thank, thank you. Uh, my question is process oriented. Uh, you mentioned a little bit about how it, it took you like three decades to write yeah. this book. Curious about your process of creation, and, and you, you mentioned a little bit about your research. Can you talk a little bit of your process from conception to final product. What's your name? Paul. So Paul's question is about the creative process for me. I think that I work in a really goofy way. I don't recommend it to anybody, Paul. So Paul, if you're writing a book, do not be like me. <laughs> so. But that said, I really believe in doing these sort of academic and journalistic interviews. So I write these huge omniscient narratives that are kind of like based on a 19th century style where you have this one omniscient narrator who knows everything. So in my kinds of books, every person in this room actually has a storyline. And if you read my books, you know what I mean, what I mean. And this is exactly what 19th century social realist novelists did. But because I've only had a couple of lives and I'm gonna be turned 50 this year, so even at age almost 50, I haven't done everything. So I have to interview people all the time. And that takes so much energy and thoughtfulness. So I will spend time, let's say, like for example, for my first book, Free Food for Millionaires, I took a class at FIT because I didn't know what designers did. Like I took a class in millinery and looked like an idiot because there are all these young Korean Americans who were um, studying millinery and they were so good at using the sewing machine because ever since they were like three, they were like, using it. And then I was just fumbling and I couldn't even thread the machine, the needle. And I remember all these girls would just like circle around me and go, they would say unni, which means like older sister. You went to Yale, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I'd be like, shut up and thread the needle. <laughs> So, anyway, that, those are my fun moments. <laughs> but um, I also spend a time like tracking people. So when I was writing about Wall Street for my first book, I would spend a lot of time with people who were working in Wall Street, kind of t shadow them throughout their day. And then when I was writing Pachinko, I did an enormous amount of field work. Like I spent a lot of time in open markets pretending almost like to try to sell things, which was absolutely terrifying. Just terrifying. I can't believe peddlers, what they do, especially if you're a young woman and you don't speak the language. Like you can't go to the bathroom, like if you're taking care of children at a certain point, what they would do is, so during the era that my character is selling food in an open market, because that's how she makes money for her family, the children used to be tied up with a rope around their waist. So they couldn't, wa they could wander off just a little bit, but not too far. Like that was babysitting. Like the rope was a babysitter. So. That, that level of research is what I like to do. And also, I, I really love academic texts. So I read a lot of sociology, history, economics, law. Like all that stuff is kind of really interesting to me. So I do a lot of that. I do a lot of interviews. And then I draft. And then I throw whole drafts away. So. Hi. I'm, Hi. I'm Sean. So it's really hey, Sean. Um, I didn't read your book. Okay. Well, because there's a quiz, though. <laughs> oh. <laughs> John, did you bring the quiz? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to shoot off of it. <laughs> uh, my question is, as a follow-up to the creative process, in saying that you do a lot of interviews, how, do you, how are you able to translate the 
emotion that you capture from, from these stories that you hear into your own platform such that readers will be able to get that emotion as well. Actually, Aristotle figured this out a long time ago. So if you read Aristotle's Poetics, and it's really a short book, he's actually writing about plays and how people write plays, tragedies and comedies. And in order for the viewer, not the, or the reader, to achieve catharsis, you have to have recognition and reversal. So I may have an interview with you, Sean, and you and I would, let's say, spend four or five hours together. I figure out who you're, you know, where you went to kindergarten and how you hold your hands together when you talk and how you nod and when you smile, you know, your, your ears kind of like move a little bit. I know. <laughs> so part of my job is to notice that, and at the same time, after four hours, I get a good sense of, you know, Sean really cares about justice, he cares about accuracy, Sean wants to do the right thing when he has an encounter with a moral dilemma. Like, let's say this is what I get from our four hours together. I don't know if I'm right. Sounds good to me. Okay. <laughs> and then afterwards, I have to figure out how you, and your name is? Sarah. Sarah. Because I, I, I was teasing you and saying there was a quiz, and you said I'll cheat off of her. Remember? I don't know if you guys heard that. I heard that. <laughs> but right now, we already have a scene. You were joking, obviously, but we have a scene in which I have a dramatic thing. So what would cause Sean to care enough to cheat on a non-essential quiz? <laughs> but maybe, maybe, you wanted to impress Sarah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Then all of a sudden, what I have done is created a drama. We have conflict. We have desire. And now what I, my job is to figure out how to take that drama and that scene and to create a recognition in either Sean or in Sarah, or ideally both, and then have a reversal of characterization, and then perhaps the viewer or the reader may feel something that I want them to feel, that that should feel authentic based on the scene. So that's what I try to do. Sorry, can I have a yeah. follow-up? Um, in your writing then, do you, when you write, do you, do you have the mind of the reader in mind when, when you're writing to make sure that what what you're writing, you know, the emotion gets across? Or, or is your process more, you're going to write it out and, and, and see how it goes and hopefully, you know. <laughs> yeah. So Sean's question is a really important question and it's the same question that I got recently when I visited a very amazing MFA program this past week in Michigan. So it's about like, do I consider the reader when I think or do I consider my characters or me? Yeah. And it depends on the draft. So by the time this book gets to you, it has been rewritten maybe 20 times in whole. A lot of hands have touched this before you got it, but even before any of the other hands touched it, I was constantly revising it. So my advice to people who are writers and you're working on a project is that for the first couple of drafts, give yourself an enormous amount of room just to write whatever you want. If you can actually just sit there and write something, good. And then after a couple of drafts and after it's finished, then you can be much more cold and look at it with the eye of an editor. But you can't look at the eye of an editor when you first start drafting, because then you won't write anything. And this is the reason why a lot of people get blocked, because they feel like, oh, it has to be perfect. The reader has to feel this. And I heard some silly writer talk about Aristotle, and I got to do this. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> the first couple of drafts, just like go for broke and enjoy yourself and play, because there's really no compensation in this career, not in a real way on a daily basis that matters enough for you to stop watching TV or not play with your children or, you know, go enjoy the sunset. I mean, there's a lot of things you could do besides writing. So if you are crazy and you want to be a writer, the first couple of drafts, I want you to have a glorious time. And then after you look at the manuscript and, and say, oh, this is not working, that part really doesn't come until it's all done. At least I think so. Some people actually edit as they're drafting. I don't know how you work that way because that would be very inhibiting for me. But if that works for you, that's okay. Yes? All right, so um, I feel like literature from Korea has been relatively uh, underrepresented uh, in English translation. So uh, I was just kind of wondering if there was Korean literature that you 
looked to for inspiration, or if you mostly focused on maybe American literature, uh, and I guess what what do you look for in your uh, crafting of your story? So my wheelhouse is Western 19th century literature, so I am interested in reading and working on books that pretty much my form that I most admire is a social realist novel of the 19th century and at the turn of the century in the United States. So the people that I really like are people like Sinclair Lewis, Edith Wharton, who are Americans, in Russia, Turgenev, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, um, in France, Balzac and Flaubert, in, um, in England, George Eliot, Charlotte, um, what do you call it, Charlotte Bronte, you know, Jane Austen a little bit, um, even, yeah. So that's sort of like what I'm really interested in terms of Western literature. That said, in terms of Korean literature, I'm actually quite well versed in Korean literature in translation. I just, the reason why I was five minutes late today is because I just filed a 3600 word review for the New York Review of Books for Han Gong's translated book, Human Acts, which I just finished. Like, I know that book inside and out now. So <laughs> if you have any questions, I'm happy to handle those. It, it's, and I'm looking at a lot of literature that's coming out, but it's really important to know that every country has a different sensibility of the novel. So it's not really fair in some ways to take a Han Gong book and compare it to a 19th century novel or even like a 21st century American book. She's almost a bit more French of the 20th century variety, more than any other that I can think of. And she's terrific. However, She's a certain acquired taste. So uh, the Korean books that I tend to like are the older ones, like um, The Land, or memoirs, uh, like let's say for example, like by Park, Park Won So. Um, I just finished reviewing a terrific book that came out a long time ago by uh, Yi Mun Yol called Appointment With My Brother. It's a really, really short book. It was just came out by Columbia University Press. So there's, it's, it's out there, it just doesn't get a lot of play. But Again, having said that, I mean, in books, in bookstores like this, really support translated literature. So I really encourage you to read widely if you like it. That said, I think you have to go to the books that give you pleasure. So I don't like telling people to read something, and if they don't like it, I'm like, don't read it anymore. Because I really, I'm more interested in you being a reader than reading the books that I think you should read. Because I think we're losing readers right now. So if you like reading and you like reading a certain kind of book or a certain kind of form or genre, then I really encourage you to read those books. But um, I don't like when it should be like eating your spinach. But I do believe that my books must be edifying, but it must be entertaining. So if my book doesn't give you pleasure in order for you to stay with it enough to like make you miss a, a stop in the subway, as well as to teach you something that's really worth knowing about life, then I don't think it's really worth it. Because I read for insight. I read for insight plus um, pleasure. Yes? Hi, um, I'm Anna. Hey. I just want to say thank you so much for this book. It's beautiful. Oh, thank um, you. I'm I didn't know I'd get so much love today. Yeah. I would have come earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I'm half Japanese and half Chinese, so I feel like the elements of World War II are very important by my family historically. Yes. given me a lot of insight about myself and also my family. Oh, I'm so glad. Um, but the, uh, the question I have for you is that when I read it, I, I felt like a very almost like objective and journalistic tone to it, which I felt gave me a lot of room for my feelings and for my interpretations. And I know that you mentioned you threw away your draft, uh, your earlier draft. I was wondering, did you find this tone after conducting your interviews? Or like, how did your tone or how did your style change, if it did, between your new draft and your old Oh, so uh, because I really like 19th century literature, and the reason why I wanted to write 19th century omniscient narration is because I wanted to write this sort of omniscient narration where everybody is involved. Because I've always felt very outside. So I feel, I always identify with literally like the dog in the scene. Like I'm like, oh, what is that puppy feeling? <laughs> That's me. <laughs> so it's not about like the person who's like the main person or who's most attractive. I'm like I want to know what these other fringe people are thinking. So I kind of need to have this big panorama. Having said that, 19th century literature is not read today mostly because the narrator is annoying. 
the narrator is really annoying. So if you read George Eliot, and I love Middle March more than any other book on the in the world, in the world, okay? That said, she's such a show off. Like I would never want to write like her in, in that style. So what I have to try to figure out is what kind of style do I admire? Like what kind of style do I want to have? And I realized I wanted to have this sort of very clean American sentence of the narrative nonfiction writers who are the greatest in America. Some of them who are still alive today, like John McPhee, Annie Dillard, Joan Didion, like their sentences, and these are nonfiction writers, exactly what you said, they're almost, they're journalists almost, right? And they write these beautiful, clean sentences, these kind of crisp American sentences, and I thought, I want to write like that. But then how do I combine a Joan Didion, Annie Dillard, John McPhee sentence with a 19th century omniscient narration? And that took me freaking forever to figure out. But now that I have done it, I feel like it gives the reader the ability to make a decision about how she or he feels. And that's really important for me to get out of the way of the story. Because if I'm going to crowd the story with a lot of people and a lot of story and plot, that means that I need to give you room to have your imagination fill in the gaps. Because that's really important. Because I didn't, I, I really like, one of the greatest things about getting older is I don't care if you think I'm smart or not. Yes. Want to stand up? Hi. Uh, hey. I just want to say thank you for your book. I'll be thank completely you. honest, I originally got it because I just wanted to support the American author. That's a good reason. <laughs> but I was pleasantly surprised by what I got of it in terms of like the three and Japanese kind of grabbing the identity. I'm also a three and American, so grappling with like two different identities, all the great different grappling with the Japanese identity. Um, so your earlier point about like kind of shame and how saving books to think about that, I was curious what your point of view is, and also what the Korean Japanese points of view were when you interviewed them about pride and how they approach pride of their nation, especially when there's two such kind of like almost contrary or maybe married identities working together. That's a really great point. So, what's your name, sweetie? Michelle. So Michelle's point, a question is really about how we approach shame depending upon, I think, South Korea or Japan and also being Korean American. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I guess I'm just curious, like, if you come from kind of two different nations, can you have pride for both of them? Like, I remember growing up, I always cheered for Korea at the Olympics, even though I do consider myself American, so like... Well, we all cheer for Chloe Kim. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like how you view, like how I was curious how the Korean Japanese people you interview did they have pride for Japan only or Korea only or how they like dealt with that? And if you have your own personal experience and opinions on Korean American identity, also. Well, I think Mil Michelle, you're answering your own brilliant question, and by that I mean our human responses to nation are so complex. And what's really so cool, it's almost like, I want to say, I, I, I think you're too young to have children. You're probably too young to even be married. But if you are, so for, I'm sure all of you have at some point loved somebody. And you probably have all loved more than one person. Do you think that the love is greater for one person than the other, or do you think the love is different? But do you have the capacity to love two people? So if you have loved, let's say, six people, do you have the capacity to love six people? I'm going to argue that you have the capacity to love multiple nations and to feel loyal to many different groups. So it doesn't always have to be this binary. I think the Olympics are kind of a funny thing because you'd have to choose one country. At the same time, very often, thankfully, they're not opposing each other. So if you're a Mets fan or a Yankees fan, but you're from New York, <laughs> what do you do? Usually you choose. However, I do think that um, when it comes to nation, what I found was that the Korean Japanese really did love Japan. They did, and very often they would go to South Korea and feel deeply hurt because a South Korean person would say something really goofy to them and wrong. And I remember in that instance when a Korean Japanese person would tell me something really hurtful that a South Korean person said, I felt really bad. And I'm thinking, I'm not even South Korean. Why am I feeling bad? But even the shame part of it, I felt a kind of responsibility. In the same way, I've had really lovely Japanese Americans come up to me and say, I'm really sorry for what they've done to the Koreans. And I'm going, you didn't do anything. But again, it's because we feel connected to larger places and tribes. And it's 
it's really ancient, our need to belong and identify. But I think it's quite lovely when we can try to reach across these tribes and feel a greater sense of love and duty, and as well as regret because the converse also holds true, which is that we can hold grudges too based upon these tribal differences. So you have to ask yourself, will I hold a grudge or will I try to love? And I think most of the problems in the world today are based on grudges that were caused by crimes hundreds of years ago. Thank you. Well, we have a last question. Uh, let's give a big hand to Benjamin.